Hello and welcome to Politics Europe, your regular guide to the top stories in Brussels and Strasbourg. On today's programme. Eastern European governments show a yellow card over plans to give equal wages to workers sent abroad within the EU. The European Commission has blocked a merger of the UK's major mobile networks, but will it mean a better deal for consumers? We've been in Strasbourg to find out exactly what MEPs make of the EU's deal with Turkey to ease the migration crisis. And we've been to Portugal to look at how the country is still struggling to recover from the economic crisis. So all that to come and more in the next half hour, though. First, this week, members of the European Parliament have been meeting in Strasbourg for their regularly plenary session. So what have they been getting up to and what else has been happening over in Brussels? Here's our guide to the latest from Europe in just 60 seconds. No doubt it was in your diary, who could forget Europe Day? All over the continent, people came together to mark the annual celebration of peace and unity. Even Nigel Farage was caught humming Beethoven's fifth. I made that last bit up. Back in the real world, EU ambassadors were dealing with the migrant crisis, backing a European Commission plan to extend internal border controls for a maximum of six months. New rules were passed to make it easier for law enforcement agency Europol to set up units to respond immediately to terrorist threats. US officials are still a bit cheesed off, with one warning that the transatlantic trade deal could be scuppered by plans to ban the sale of American-made products labelled feta or champagne. And remember all that peace and unity? Yeah, it came under strain with 11 countries showing a yellow card to the European Commission over its recent proposal to ensure equal pay for workers posted overseas. Happy Europe Day! And for the next 30 minutes, I'm joined by the UKIP MEP, Jonathan Arnott, and the Labour MEP, Richard Howard. Welcome to you both. Now, let's take a look at one of these stories in more detail. That's the decision by a group of East European governments to flash a yellow card at a European Commission proposal uh, to level wage differences between local workers and those posted abroad within the EU. They're known as posted uh, workers. How, it's quite hard to make the yellow card stick, I think, isn't it? This is the third time it's happened, but for those that say those in democracy in Europe, here it is, national parliaments having a voice. And, of course, the deal that's going to the British referendum is a red card and would we'll take it one step further. Now, on this issue, I and Labour actually do want action to stop exploitation of workers' rights. So you'd rights. be against the yellow card? So we'll carry on arguing the case that we right. want that... Want that change. But the very fact that there is a democratic debate going on, one that I hope and believe we can win, uh, on the very fundamental principle, by the way, of equal pay uh, for uh, mm. uh, for workers, wh whichever country you're from. That's a big protection uh, for low-paid, insecure workers here in Britain. But I expect we can win that, but winning it in a democratic fashion. That's what European politics should be about. What do you say, to, not so much on the issue itself, but on the ability of European parliaments to lay a, a down a yellow card if they don't like what's going on in Brussels? Well, as has been mentioned already, it's only the third time that it's happened in a number of years. It's a very difficult procedure to implement. It's very clunky. It takes uh, at, least, uh, at least nine countries to... Uh, all within eight weeks get something through their own individual parliaments mm -hmm. to be able to say to the Commission, we want you to think again. Of course, on one of those previous two occasions when this happened on the European Public Prosecutor's Office, the Commission made it actually quite clear that it's going to plough ahead with that kind of thing anyway, and we see that coming through the European Parliament time and time again. And is that likely to happen again? Well, we'll see. But if you take the public prosecutor example, we do need to clamp down on tax evasion, uh, on corruption, and Europe needs to have uh, more teeth. And when you but you've, and, you've, uh, you've changed, uh, the, you've changed and the, the Eurosceptic MEPs vote against banking regulation, vote against uh, cracking down on tax havens. Is that really what people want? I don't believe it is. Nobody's saying that you shouldn't crack down on tax havens. What well, we're saying, that what, way, we're saying what we're saying is that you we vote should, against what we're saying reports. is that we should do that at Westminster. It should be something that we should do as a British government, not something which should be done 
at EU level. And, and you moved the goalposts there quite neatly because we were having a discussion, of course, about the democratic issue. You were telling us how democratic it was. I pointed out, of course, that it's not actually that democratic for the Commission to comply right. on anyway. And then you moved on to the issue instead of on to the principle. Well, we shall see. And we thank Jeremy Corbyn for raising this at PMQs. Otherwise, we wouldn't really have known what the Posted Worker Directive Twice uh, he's was. raised uh, so, Labour MEPs go. and Tory um, MEPs voting records in Prime um, Minister's questions. We've now followed it. And I'm going to move on. Now, the £10.3 billion deal to marry O2 and 3 to mobile companies was meant to be a sort of final reshaping of Britain's mobile phone market. It would have left the UK with just three major mobile network operators. But the EU's competition commissioner had other ideas and she's blocked the takeover on the grounds it would reduce customer choice and raise prices. To tell us more, I'm joined by the BBC's technology correspondent, Rory Kethlin jones Rory, uh, nice to see you again. Uh, what is the... If this was a merger between two British companies, uh, largely affecting the British market, what's the provenance of Brussels in this kind of uh, merger? Well, deals above a certain level do get referred to Brussels. Interestingly, though, the BTEE merger, which uh, was probably even a bigger deal, Indeed. that stayed in Britain because just about everything to do with it was happening in Britain. Don't forget, O2 and uh, three are effectively two uh, foreign companies. O2 is owned by Spain's Tel Telefonica. It wanted to get rid of it. Uh, and three is owned by Hong Kong's uh, uh, Hutchison, which wanted to buy it. And in fact, they were both very keen to have this case decided in Brussels because mm. they thought Brussels would be uh, kinder to them uh, than our regulator Ofcom. <laughs> in the end, uh, that Ofcom, <laughs> well, yeah, that didn't work. Of Ofcom uh, made its views very strong, strongly known in Brussels, wrote uh, a, a number of stiff letters saying, we don't really want to go down from four operators to three. Uh, and in the end, Brussels, um, Brussels agreed. And yeah. that's come as a shock, really, to the whole European telecoms industry. So this is, that's in interesting, Roy. This is not a case of this being approved by the British competition authorities and then being overruled by the Brussels competition authorities. This went to Brussels and the British competition authorities are pretty happy with the result. Is that, is that a fair summary? They're very happy. They seem worried at an earlier stage that Brussels was going to let this through uh, against their will. And of course, the, 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 the big telecoms companies are pretty cross about this. They're, 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 mm. They would rather Europe looked at the market as a whole, looked at how, um, how many players there are in the market uh, across Europe rather than just one country, because <coughs> they feel there needs to be a bit of consolidation because mm. they don't think they're making enough money in Europe. What will they? Well, God, they should look at my roaming charges and wonder why they're not. Uh, what will the two, these big two companies do now? Do we have any say? Is that it? Is that, that it over for the merger? Uh, well, it's probably over for this merger, although there's talk of Hutchison, uh, the owner of three, appealing. But Telefonica, which owns O2, will, will look for another, another partner. It really wants, wants shot of this business. Uh, and okay. it, uh, it, it'll hunt around and there's talk of uh, Virgin's owner, Liberty Global, perhaps coming in for the business instead. Okay. Rory, thank you for that. Good to talk to you again. Uh, what, what, you, you, this is probably, is it not quite good okay. news for British consumers? It keeps up choice and competition for mobile phone users? Well, in a lot of ways, this is exactly the same principle as the previous discussion that we've just had, because ah. we've had to go out to Brussels to get an answer for something, and, and in fact, in the end, have the same thing that Ofcom wanted in the first place. So I believe that that should have been a decision for the UK to take. Whether we have three or four mobile phone operators in the UK, there are a lot of issues surrounding that, and that is something which should fundamentally be a decision for the British government. The fact okay. that that is being decided by Brussels is a fundamental problem. OK, but though it seems it was decided by Brussels because that's what, according to Rory, that's what the companies, that's where they wanted it to be decided. But putting that aside, what do you say to his more general point? The, the number of mobile phone companies we should have operating in Britain should be a matter for the Brits. Look, this is a, a proposed merger between a Spanish uh, giant, Telefonica, and a Hong Kong-based giant, mm. Hutchison Wampoa, who, by the way, run they're a good company. They run Felix Stowe in my own constituency. <laughs> but the, the idea... But it's for the British market. ...that, that, um, the, the, the European uh, Union shouldn't have a view about that when they've also, by the way, stepped in and stopped similar mergers recently in, in Denmark and mm. in Italy. 
Uh, and you know, but I guess his point is they shouldn't be doing that either. That I, I, I can see the point. That Brussels getting involved if it's a matter of European-wide competition. But if this merger effectively was about the British market, should it not just be left to the British competition authorities? It doesn't sound more already said that the result would have been any different, but it's, again, a matter of sovereignty. Well, it is, first of all, it is right to say that this is another great example where what Britain wanted won. We do win the arguments. But secondly, yes, it is in Europe's interest, for, in our industry's interest, that we have uh, uh, investment in mobile phone technology. We've gone to 3G, to 4G. The next generation will be 5G when we, yes. everything we're going to be doing on our mobile phones. And there is an issue. What is going to get the new infrastructure invested in by these big companies? Mm. Uh, and it is competition, not consolidation. All of the evidence shows that. What do you say? And, and I have no problem with competition. And indeed, uh, the, the, U the UK should be taking those decisions. And I believe that the decision would have been the correct one had we decided it's in the UK. But we shouldn't have to uh, apply to Brussels, go cap in hand to Brussels, to ask no whether they me. will... Whether they no will one went cap in hand. Some of these things are good things and why don't we just wake up and recognize it and probably you uh, do pay a lot because, of roaming charges but the average telephone user is paying 52 pounds less a year on their mobile phone bill because europe capped the mobile phone charges oh, took, you, took, you a while. took you a while took you a while this is this is this took you a while though didn't <laughs> you look, look on my phone network if i if i'm in switzerland if i'm in the usa there are no roaming charges whatsoever it's called the free market it's bringing prices down not just in the eu but outside the european union and how much does switzerland Union's pay over. to be part of europe's single market as much as we do never forget that <laughs> we're moving on to a different subject here so let's do the same the deal struck between the EU and Turkey aimed at easing Europe's migrant crisis uh, has had some success. It's contributed to a major easing of the flow of people across the Aegean Sea from Turkey to Greece. But it's not been without controversy, not at all. Part of the deal was to give Turkey's around 79 million citizens visa-free access to the EU, should they choose it, and the promise of progress on talks about Turkey becoming a member of the European Union. But this week, it's looked under serious strain over Turkey's refusal to change its laws on terrorism. There were a lot of conditions to this visa-free travel laid down by the EU. Our Joko, she's in Strasbourg, and she's been finding out more. Migrants crossing illegally from Turkey into Greece are now being sent back. The one-for-one -one deal so far slowing the influx of migrants to European shores. For every migrant deported to Turkey, a legitimate Syrian refugee is resettled in the EU. So what does Turkey get in return? Well, so far, €3 billion Euros in aid and the prospect of visa-free travel for its citizens in the Schengen area if the country meets certain standards. The question over whether those have been reached has opened up a huge gulf between the Commission and the European Parliament. The Turkish visa issue was debated here in Strasbourg this week with general agreement that the country is still falling short of the requirements. A majority in this parliament uh, has stated also clearly that we believe that over the last years, and especially if you look during the last 12 months, Turkey is increasingly moving away from meeting European standards rather than what, would you, what one would expect from a candidate EU country is to move towards meeting standards. We have great concerns in the parliament when it comes to the rule of law, democracy, press freedom. There are five EU benchmarks that need to be reached by Turkey on corruption, data protection, reaching a deal with Europol, judicial cooperation on criminal matters and new legislation on terrorism. Despite high-level talks between EU officials and Turkish ministers, some MEPs are up in arms about the whole deal itself. Uh, I think that the best way forward is to put our own house in order. Uh, to solve uh, ourselves that uh, refugee crisis uh, by putting in place a European border and coast guard, what we don't have, by putting in place uh, a new a European asylum system, not longer the Dublin system, and by putting in place also uh, new ways for legal migration. 
The German Chancellor Angela Merkel has been accused of literally rolling out the red carpet for Turkey in exchange for the country's help to deal with the migrant crisis. There are many MEPs here at the European Parliament who also believe it brings the idea of Turkey's accession to the EU a step closer. That claim's been dismissed by members of her political group. She's really fighting for a good neighbourhood. She's really working on the issue and tries to convince uh, Turkey because Turkey is an important partner in the NATO partnership. Turkey is important as neighbour in between this area of Syria, Iraq, so crisis areas. But MEP sceptical of the entire European project claim its leaders are deliberately linking the migrant deal with talks of Turkey's EU membership because they're looking ahead beyond the current crisis. Monsieur Juncker, Monsieur Schulz. Juncker, Schulz and Merkel want to allow Turkey into the European Union because it will mean cheaper labour and lower wages for workers in many countries. Time is running out. MPs are due to vote on the visa-free travel deal on June the 28th, five days after the UK's referendum. The signs are it'll be rejected. Turkey's president has warned that if his country isn't given the visa waiver, he will end the migration deal. Our Joko reporting there from Strasbourg. Is this EU, essentially German-Turkey deal, is it in danger now of unravelling? Well, it is an EU deal. Uh, but it was done by the Germans. Um, is it sustainable? Does it fully respect human rights? We don't know, and we're asking some very, very tough questions about it. But Do you have to approve it uh, we, as a parliament? We didn't have to approve the original deal. Our job as a parliament is to scrutinise this deal, but we're also responsible for some of the cash, none of which, by the way, goes to the Turkish government. It's going straight mm. through NGOs to the refugees and to assist them. But it has stopped people dying at sea. Mm. We have to welcome that, surely. It mm. has improved the welfare of people hungry and defenceless in Turkey. But and are you worried uh, about it? Of course I'm worried about the, about the deal. Some of the human rights NGOs have pulled out of the refugee camps that the European mm. Union is running because they don't believe international humanitarian law is properly being respected. Of well, course I'm worried about but, that. But do you, is there a danger this deal will now unravel or in your view should it unravel? Should we have done this deal in the first place? Well, my, my point of view, of course, is that the UK should vote to leave the European Union. That so bit so what the European Union does in its dealings with Turkey is up to the European Union. Whilst we're still in, I have big problems over the visa liberalisation. I have big problems over the amount of money that we are sending out to Turkey and other mm. uh, candidate members uh, for, for, for the European Union. We're sending a lot of British taxpayers' money out to those countries at the moment to help them join the EU. I see that as a massive problem. So in terms of the, the deal itself, if the UK weren't in the European Union, I'd say, well, it's a matter for the EU to decide what it wants to do. With the UK in, I have a big concern about it, the visual, it only visual affects Schengen and, and we're not in Schengen. I, it, it certainly does mean that it's a lot easier for people to get closer to the UK and, and as we've seen yeah, but the, the, the rules for Turkish, to get across a lot the, the, the visa free yeah. waiver for Turks and only about 7 million Turks have passports anyway so it's not like it really is 79 million uh, are going to start wanting to come it still doesn't get them into this country. I, I, are, you, are you saying that more people, more Turks wouldn't apply for passports? I, I think I think. I'm not sure they well, might, but that's quite, quite a long. Would. That's quite a, um, a, a, a prolonged process. I suppose what concerns people is this: for a long period, the European Union rewarded Turkey with accession talks and, and access to the single market as Turkey liberalised, became more modern, more democratic, and so on. Now it seems to be rewarding Turkey as it becomes more theocratic, less liberal. Uh, and more authoritarian. We've seen the Prime Minister who did this deal with the EU, he's been shunted out of the way by the President, who may now be putting one of his relatives in as Prime Minister. That's not good for the EU. And possibly uh, wants to change the Constitution and have even more power in his own hands. Mm. So yes, I'm not going to, to hide those concerns. But what I will say, uh, um, not simply is that the humanitarian case 
to help the refugees in Turkey. In economic cost terms, it's a lot cheaper to help refugees where but, they are now than coming to Britain. And you're right, this is a long-term issue. UKIP in the local election campaign ran a party political broadcast where they said 15 million Turks would get, come to Great Britain by 2020. It's not true. You've heard the parliamentary mm. negotiator in your interview say that this is something they're moving further away from, not closer to, and that double the number you even have a passport are going to come by 2020. Well, you no, cannot believe okay. the claims well, that no, no, made no, by no the EU No one's saying that that your many people will be... In, no, one's saying that, no, one's say, no one's saying that didn't that many it? people... No, it didn't. No, it didn't. So what are you saying? Look, what we're we're saying is that (laughs) if Turkey joins the European Union and more accession chapters are being opened as part of this process, then eventually there would be the free movement right for anybody from Turkey who wished to come to the UK to come. And that could be some quite significant numbers. Nobody can say how many would come. We can say how many would have the right to come. Provided we didn't veto it, of course. And... The French didn't have a referendum. Both things, I would suggest. Well, maybe I, I think unlikely. it's very likely, that actually, the that the UK... We have that a the British th- veto against Turkey joining. It's something that is only going to happen, if ever, and in the long term. And yet one the EU minister. leave side in this referendum simply want yes. to scare people. So the Prime Minister... The problem, but, the, but, the problem, but the problem with vetoes, of course, is that once you've given it up, you can't get it back. And... And you've got to trust Cameron not okay. to give it up. You've got to trust Corbyn. No, not to give I it take up. your point. And, and, and only recently, the Prime the Minister not to give it only up. Only recently, the Prime Minister was seemed to be a big fan of Turkey joining the EU. Indeed. Anyway, we will move on to Portugal, because it was the third Euro area country to have to ask for a bailout after Greece and Ireland during the economic crisis that followed the banking crash in 2008, and this was done in 2009. It's still facing low growth. It's struggling to balance its books. In the latest of our Meet the Neighbour series, Adam Fleming has been there to find out more. I suppose this is Portugal's Birmingham, its second city, Porto. During the Eurozone crisis, Portugal was bailed out by the EU to the tune of 78 billion euros, that's about 62 billion pounds, on the condition that they made big cuts to public spending. Portugal left the bailout programme two years ago, which means everything's fine. Or is it? Not according to Guy and Pedro, they're underemployed architects who now host walking tours with a bailout theme. First stop, a new hotel built with EU funds. In this case, and in many others, so it's, we're not blaming this hotel in particular or anything like that, or even the hotel people, because that's not the issue. Uh, the question is, this hotel had over 5 million euros in uh, tax money from Europe. Yeah? So the question is, we're not, at least in Portugal, there's not a debate on this. There's not a, 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 a general conversation about what are we supposed to do with tax money. Instead, they'd rather see this old car parts factory spruced up for the benefit of locals. Ah, there would be an informal school, some places to um, take care of your bikes over there, a workshop for wood and metal in the middle. Yeah, it yeah. needs quite a lot of work, doesn't well, it? Well, I'm an optimist, you know. On the way, you notice a lot of empty shops. The thing that upsets these two the most, though, is how many of their friends have emigrated. I feel feel sad that so many people had to go. That I don't like, because I don't think it's smart as a country logic, yeah? We're gonna, we're desperately needing those same people that we lost in some way. So that makes me sad. The rest, no, the rest is not so bright politics, yeah? Things are looking much, well, rosier here. The Fladgate Partnership owns some big Port Brands. It's a British-run company that's done okay despite the financial crisis. It produced a lot of opportunities. You know, we've bought a number of businesses. We've launched businesses. I mean, people thought I was absolutely insane to be launching a five-star luxury hotel in 2010 in the middle of the crisis. You know, but the truth is, you know, people want to travel, people want to explore, people want to discover, and this is what you can do here in Portugal. So people are coming. And so, so yes, recession is tough, but. It's in those environments where good businesses tend to to do well and the weaker businesses do tend to get weeded out. 
Although politics in this country is now more of a complicated cocktail, a coalition government led by socialists propped up by communists with a right-wing president and the European Commission keeping a close eye on what's going on. Adam living the life there in Portugal. Uh, the Eurozone crisis never quite goes away, does it? For at least the pain for the people and those that are most affected. Yeah, the, the Portuguese socialists have struck up a good relationship with British Labour and Jeremy Corbyn personally, and you've got a, a minority government there that is going to be out of the, the uh, bailout scheme this year, uh, and which uh, repl has replaced okay. a Conservative government that brought in all the cuts, all right. but where the debt went up. Okay. So it's, a, it's a better news story we than, have than to... you think. OK, we shall see. That's it for now. Thank you for joining us. Come back and see us again soon. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.